Welcome to the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, where you get multifamily investing made real. Learn from top players in the real estate investment world as they share their secrets with you and discover proven strategies on apartment investing that actually work. To learn more about Wheelbarrow Profits, visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. Now to your hosts, Jake and Gino. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Senziano, host of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father of six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barbaro. Gino, how's it going? Mr. Stenziano, doing good today. How you doing, bro? Always making it happen, and I'm super excited about today's guest because he doesn't know it, but I think he played a part in our uh, business relationship and the growth of our business, and, and I'm going to dive into that a little bit right now. I was actually driving from New York to Tennessee in an interview back in 2011 when we were just kind of getting into this stuff together, right? And I was actually listening to The Go-Giver on Audible, which you just picked up. We're not promoting Audible, but it works, right? We're liking the Audible. So I think, I, I think that, you know, these things weave themselves into our lives and we pick up nuggets, you know, from, from these, you know, the different educational series that we get into. So that's a teaser. We're going to get into more of it. But today's guest is none other than The Go-Giver himself, Bob Berg. Bob is the author of a number of books on sales, marketing, influence, with total book sales, sales well over a million copies. His book, The Go-Giver, co-authored with John David Mann itself, has sold over 700,000 copies and had been translated into 21 languages. I can't even speak English. So that's, that's amazing, right? So that's fantastic. His newest book, uh, the Parable in the Go-Giver series, The Go-Giver Influencer, is scheduled to be released on April 10th. Bob is an advocate and supporter and defender of the free enterprise system, believing that the amount of money one makes is directly proportional to how many people they serve. That is fantastic. Bob, without further ado, welcome to the show. Thank you. I can't believe I've, I've, I've made it on the show with Jake and Gino. <laughs> That's you know, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things that everyone needs to do once in their life. We'll just put that. So. <laughs> well, Bob, I've got to say, it's pretty, it's pretty funny that Jake actually read a book that I didn't read, which was amazing. When he said he read the book and I didn't read it, I got really jealous. I said, <laughs> I got to pick up the book. Two days later, it was in my inbox. It took me a day and a half to consume it. I would want to say it's life-altering to me, but pretty close because I've made it a to-do read for every employee that we have because wow. I love the message in it. It's a simple read, but it's such a profound read that from what I found, is like, wow, this is what we all should be practicing and preaching. So I want to get into your story. How did you get into writing? I mean, how did you start out with this message in this book? Well, uh, very briefly, I began as a broadcaster, first in, in radio and then in, in uh, television. I, I was news late night news guy for a very small ABC affiliate in the Midwest. Uh, wasn't very good at it, and I kind of learned quickly that wasn't going to be my life's work. And I graduated into sales, uh, knowing nothing about sales. And uh, I floundered for the first few months until I was in a, a, a bookstore. And this is almost 40 years ago now. So this is when bookstores were mainly known wow. for books, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, as opposed to coffee and pastry and, and everything. And there was a, a business section there. So I looked and I saw some books on sales, which surprised me because I didn't realize that was a thing. I didn't realize <laughs> the training at the company I was with was negligible at best. I just thought you knocked on doors, made calls, went in, talked about your product and boom. Uh, again, I floundered because <laughs> that's not what sales is about. And so I picked up a book by a guy named Tom Hopkins. It was called How to Master the Art of Selling, mm -hmm. which is now a classic. And I remember taking that home. And, and again, I had hope right there because, wow, you mean there's actually a, a methodology, a way to do this. And I just started practicing. I mean, I, I just immersed myself in his book and made notes and highlighted and practiced and drilled and rehearsed. And, and within three weeks, my sales began to go through the roof. And to me, the interesting thing was there was, there was not a significant difference in me, but there was in my production. Why? Well, now I was working with a system, a way of doing so. I, I define a system simply as the process of predictably achieving a goal based on a logical and specific set of how-to principles, which of course is what you all teach, right? And so mm -hmm. a, the key is predictability. If it's been proven that by doing A, you'll get the desired result of B, 
then you know all you need to do is A and continue to do A, you'll eventually get the desired result of B. So from there, I just began studying everything I could on sales, Zig Ziglar and all the, and then of course started reading books that were personal development in nature because one thing about sales, it's really about building yourself from the inside, the success manifests on the outside. So I began just, just devouring books like Think and Grow Rich and How to Win Friends and Influence People and Psycho Cybernetics and The Magic of Thinking Big and As a Man Thinking and just boom, 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 boom and uh, became an avid learner. And so uh, eventually I worked my way up to sales manager of a company and began teaching others how to do what I was doing, yada, 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 as the old sitcom you know, would say, and, and uh, eventually began uh, a business where I was teaching sales and, and communication and, and so forth. And uh, from there, books became a, writing books became a part of the, uh, the business. So how did you get the idea for The Go-Giver? How, how did the story come about and how did you, you know, put it all together? Yeah, so I had a book, my, my biggest book to that point was called Endless Referrals, Network Your Everyday Contacts into Sales. That came out in the early 90s. It's since been revised a few times. And um, uh, it's a how-to book for how to how people who are in sales, who believe in what they're doing, they know they bring great value to the equation, but they're not comfortable with developing and cultivating those relationships that bring them lots and lots of new business and referrals. Mm -hmm. So it was endless referrals, network your everyday contacts into sales, really how to build relationships that would result in people feeling so good about you. They would know you, like you, trust you, want to be a part of your life, want to be a part of your business, want to refer you to others. And so I, I had always loved reading parables and I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could take that basic idea, the basic premise, all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust, and turn that into a, a parable. So the first question I asked was, okay, so what's the basic substance of those relationships? And it comes as a result of always giving, giving value to everyone you meet. So they came up with the name The Go-Giver, which was, of course, um, uh, opposite of, not opposite of, but but kind of uh, positioned against the go-getter, which was more, however, let me just say first, uh, I'll do a par parenthetical statement here. We love go-getters. Go-getters take action, mm -hmm. right? We know you can have a great idea. You can want to invest as much as you want. It's a great idea, but unless you put action into the mix, unless you study under you guys, unless you start putting that into action, right? Nothing's going to happen. So we love go-getters. And, and so the opposite of a go-giver is not a go-getter. The opposite of a go-giver is a go-taker. Mm -hmm. That's the person who's focused on just getting, taking, taking, right, and so forth. So we love go-getter, be a go-getter and a go-giver, just not a go-taker. But, but positioning-wise, that title was a good one. And, it was, and because the go-getter is a, 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 a more well-known term, go-giver was sort of a pattern interrupt, which we like and people take notice mm -hmm. and that was also basically uh, the 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 idea but the biggest thing for me was bringing john david mann into this and uh, john i knew as a a great writer he had at that time kind of a niche now you go into a bookstore there's five or ten of his books mm -hmm. that are on the bestseller list he's so in demand as a co-author by everyone back then only a relatively small group knew of his brilliance for telling a story Fortunately, I was one of those people who knew. So, <laughs> so you I got in early. Uh, and when I say I asked, I mean, I pleaded with him. Uh -huh. the, uh, the co author, but really the lead writer and the storyteller. And so mm -hmm. we worked together on it, and, and, uh, and, and that's kind of how it happened. That's awesome. You, you talk about the entrepreneurial spirit, but what about those who aren't entrepreneurs? Uh, does, the, does the message in the goal giver just, they, does that still apply to them, that message? Sure. Well, we think of the entrepreneur as being that person who goes out on their own. They take a risk. Uh, they risk their own their effort, sweat equity, their own money, and maybe other people's money as well. And they, and it's really, uh, and what they have to do is they have got to provide value to the marketplace in order to make this business work. Sure, that's an entrepreneur. But even someone who works within another person's company, they are an intrapreneur they still have to do that same thing. Only their customers or clients are the people they work with, the people they work for, the people they lead, the people they follow, the people who their their employer, and maybe ultimately the end user, even if they never directly meet with them. So you still have to, you know, here's what it comes down to. When I speak at, at 
to entrepreneurial groups or at sales conferences, I'll often begin by saying, and I don't say this in a mean way, I just say it kind of jokingly, but as a way we all know it, it's true, is nobody's going to buy from you because you have a quota to me, right? They're not going to buy from you because you need the money, and they're not even going to buy from you because you're a really nice person who believes in what you do. They're going to buy from you because they believe they will be better off by doing so than by not doing so. And in a mm -hmm. free market-based environment where no one's forced to buy from us, that's the only reason why they should buy. Now, for an intrapreneur, for someone working well, I would say the same thing. No one's going to hire you. No one's going to keep you. No one's going to pay you a salary because you have a mortgage payment or because you're saving for your mm -hmm. kid's college or because you need the money. Okay, they're going to keep they're going to hire you, keep you, promote you, what have you, because they believe that they will be better off by doing so than by not doing so. So you're doing the same as an entrepreneur, just in a different environment. Bob, I think I have a uh, feeling that Jake's going to bring about his Radio Shack story. Jake, you want to jump in and talk about Radio Shack real quick? <laughs> which, part, yeah. which part of Radio Shack do you want to hear, Gina? We got, we got Radio Shack all day long. Here, so. <laughs> I'm just thinking about you being the entrepreneur, working for somebody, and just making it happen, being the go-getter. All right. Well, your, if you're going to tee it up, then let's talk about Radio Shack then, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so Bob, you know my, you know I have a sales background. Before uh, I was a real estate entrepreneur, and we started these, you know, various companies. And real estate uh, it was the best thing that's happened to me. But Radio Shack changed my life. And you know I grew up in a small town, and it was really you could kind of you could work at the uh, factory. You know, a lot of my relatives were in law enforcement, or you know the school employed many people in town. That was kind of it. So I went to school to become a gym teacher. And what I realized, these kids were unmotivated and I hated it because I was like, let's go play dodgeball and beat each other up kind of thing. Right. And I was all into it. And this kid's like, I don't want to go play dodgeball. I don't want to play football. I'm like, what's wrong with you? So to speed this thing up, I got a, uh, I got a break. You know, I got a, a friend of mine said, Hey, Radio Shack's hiring. And, uh, and, you know, it seems like that you can really make some good money. I'm like, whatever, I'll try it. You know, I just needed money. I was in college. And uh, within a month or two, I was the number one sales rep. It was commission based in the whole Rochester region. And I carried that until I moved on to bigger and better things. And it was just, you know, it's, it's finding what you like and, and finding what you can excel at. And, and I just, you know, I absolutely love sales. And it was, it was that part of just being out there and being able to serve and give people the best possible service when they come in, make them feel, you know, that, that you're there for them and providing that service exactly. uh, carried me into much greater things in my career. So guys, giving and providing service is what it's all about. And I think that's where Gina was going with this. Well, you know, you make a great point and, 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 you know, you talk about sales and so many people will say, oh, well, I can't sell or I would never want to be in sales. Or It's only because the word sales, they're seeing it from a false premise. Mm -hmm. See, many people think of sales as, as uh, you know, trying to uh, convince someone to buy something they don't want or need. That's not selling. Mm -hmm. That's called being a con artist. And none of us would want to do that. Fortunately, that's not selling. Selling by definition is simply discovering what the other person does want, does need, does desire, and helping them to get it. Yep. And the only way we can do that effectively is by, by asking questions and listening. And listening not to come back or sharp angle them or just, you know, but listening to really understand where they're coming from and what it is they're needing from us. And it's only at the point that we truly understand this that we can then match the benefits of our product or service with what they want, need, or desire. It all comes from our focus being on them. When we talk about giving, when we say the go-giver, we're giving, we simply mean shifting your focus, understanding that, that bringing value to others constantly and consistently is not only a, a, a nice way, a pleasant way of conducting business, it's the most financially profitable way as well. Because remember, it's all about them. And this is why we say that money is an echo of value. Mm -hmm. Money is simply an echo of value. So, so Bob, the reason I love you is because I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth or just assume, but I think you're more in the Jeffrey Gittimer camp of sales training because I, I love you. I love Jeffrey Gittimer where it's all about building rapport and service versus the, I know there's this whole, you know, big thing when you get to the big companies now, it's all about finding the pain, right? What's your pain? And we're going to solve that 
problem. It's great to ask questions and try to dig deeper and everything. But I think there's this, this big push now in most larger corporations where they're trying to like pin somebody in a corner and ask like this series of questions because they need it to be predictable to a certain extent. And I think if you, if you can really do you know what the go-giver says get out there build rapport find the needs but don't try to pin somebody in the corner which a lot of these programs are sort of teaching i think that is that that's the preferred method for me and that's that's sort of what i always kind of uh, gravitated towards yeah i mean i you know i, I think it depends where where are you coming from with sales if you think it's yeah. something you against them yeah then you're going to do something that, that you, you know, you're, then you're trying to overcome them. Right. <laughs> you know? And so I, I think it's a matter of really being genuinely interested in caring yes. about them and really wanting to help them. I mean, Hey, you know, it, what happens with the, 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 the finding the pain thing is we're, we're taught so often in, in maybe traditional sales, or if you want to say old school sales or how, however you want to say it. And I don't want to be disrespectful to yeah. any of that. Just, just to say that there was a certain way of teaching where immediately upon meeting someone, you found their pain, right? You try, you yeah. reach their heart and tore it out, right? To try to find the weakness they're having. So that, right. And what I would, say instead is build a relationship first which yes. doesn't mean by the way that this takes longer it doesn't it takes shorter time to it's the professional way to do it though that's that's how the, the pros do it sure now there's a certain now as, as a salesperson depending upon your product or service you are often solving a pain okay there's mm -hmm. a certain point where yes you need to tactfully help them understand not only where the pain now if you're doing it correctly they're going to tell you right and then you're going to help them solve this. So yeah, there is a point point you're certainly working within their pain if that's your product or service. If it's a matter of that is the idea of your product or service, you're solving a pain point for them. But it's a matter of not focusing on trying to overcome someone as much as trying to see where can you where can you help someone and partner with them. Challenge. You're you're part exactly. It's the two of you together trying to solve something, bringing them value as they see and that. building trust well you've got to do that first you've got to do that throughout the entire process trust is really the key um, and, and you know you think about it um, Simon Sinek who wrote a great book um, uh, leaders eat last and he defined uh, uh, trust as a biological reaction to the belief that someone has our well-being at heart and you know, I think really that's what it's about because when someone truly understands that you genuinely and authentically have their well-being at, at heart, they're much more likely to do business with you. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think the person who builds relationships like this and does it as you're saying, uh, the, the actual selling process is shortened. It's not lengthened. People often say, well, isn't this go-giver thing? I can see where, yeah, it's great if you don't need the money. But which I, I don't even get that premise. It doesn't but, make sense. Yes. But right. But I need the money now. Okay. So let's go with that then. So you go into a a, um, a presentation. You have a prospect in front of you. You need the money now, and that's your focus. So as you're speaking to this person, they can sense that what you care about is not them, but about their money. Right. And maybe you ask some questions, but you're interrupting or if they have an objection, you're kind of jumping on them because you're defensive and you're not real. Are they more likely or less likely to buy from you right now? No, uh, of course likely. not. Mm -hmm. But when you go in there and by the way, that's not to say you don't care about them. I mean, you're in business. You do have to make a, a profit, but that's not the point. There's no dichotomy between focusing on their needs, wants and desires in you making a profit. Money is the echo of value. Or as Zig Ziglar said, and it, this quote of his always gets mangled, which I hate, but what he really said is, you can have everything in life you want if you'll just help enough other people get what they want, okay? Mm -hmm. So here's, so if I can make a suggestion, and this is for the people who say, okay, Bob, I, I kind of get it, but what if I do really need the money? What if I am? Well, it's okay you are self-interested because you're a human being. We're all self-interested. We're not saying to deny your self-interest. We're not saying to, to try to in any way deny it. What we're saying is temporarily suspend it. Put it off to the side. 
Okay. Bob, I got I to jump in here because I don't think you're temporarily suspending it. I think you need to take a long view approach to it because ultimately what you're saying is you're going to get paid more in the long term by, yes, temporarily suspending it. But what, it is, what this looks like and what this looks like done right is if you have a customer, they're willing to call you over on the weekend to come have dinner with them or go out to lunch or interact with their family. And, and when it comes time when they need it, it's not even a question of they're calling competitor A or B. They just know they're calling Bob because Bob's the guy that I trust. Bob's the guy that put the work in to build the relationship. It doesn't happen overnight. And Bob's the guy I'm going with because I know he's going to do me right. That's what it looks like long term. Yeah, well, and I'm going to tell you something. And it works faster short term too. And yeah. that's what I want to assure people. Because when people say, well, I can see how long term, yeah, that would work. But in the short term, I need the money. And what I'm <clears> saying is, well, if you're focused on the money, if you're letting your self-interest control you, you're not going to make the sale mm -hmm. because they're going to know this. So that's why I'm saying suspend your, your self-interest. Put it aside. Now, what you're going to see is that it's a really good business to do. Yes. That's what I'm saying. You're going you're gonna to do much better, and that's where your self-interest, you just got to have a long view. And I'm not saying it's going to take years to do, but you know, as a guy, you know, I spent 10 years or whatever in sales. I saw that if you invest in the customer and that relationship there, and, and you're focused on, on their best interest and their needs, you, you guys are going to crush it. Absolutely. And, and guys, this is the reason why I want to teach financial freedom to people, because I just dawned on me. I became financially free on March 16th, March of 2016. And when you become financially free, you're not always worrying about making that next mortgage payment. You can focus your attention on helping others. This is why we created the Jake and Gino platform. I've been basically writing articles and not being able to monetize for the last 18 months. And all of a sudden, I'm getting a swell now because I put that time into it. And I wasn't always looking at the dollar amount. And But it's really hard to do that when you are in the grind the nine to five. Absolutely. So that's why I want people to really focus on achieving financial freedom. And when, once you do achieve it, the opportunities are amazing. Your mind becomes open. You're, you're willing to give more time to yourself. You're able to because you don't have to work and you're just able to focus on what you love and your passion. It's so much easier to, to, you know, to reach people out. I hope that makes sense to people. But I mean, that's what I found in the last couple of years of my life. Absolutely. You know, um, Bob, I want you to jump into those five laws in the book. I think everyone's got to listen to the five laws. Anyone has a pen and paper, write these five laws down. I wrote a book review. So if you want to write them down, go to jakeandgina.com. I wrote a book review and the book is awesome. But just jump into those five laws. Sure. The laws themselves are the laws of value, compensation, influence, authenticity, and receptivity. The law of value says your true worth in the business sense is um, determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment, which sounds kind of counterintuitive when you first hear it. Give more in value than I take in payment? Uh, doesn't, that, uh, doesn't that sound like a recipe for bankruptcy? <laughs> So we have to understand the difference between price and value. Mm -hmm. Price is a dollar figure. It's a dollar amount. It's finite. It is what it is. Value, on the other hand, is the relative worth or desirability of a thing, of something to the end user or beholder. In other words, what is it about this thing, this product, service, concept, idea, what have you, that brings so much worth or value to someone that they will willingly exchange their money for it and be ecstatic that they did while you make a very healthy profit. Can I share a really quick example? Yeah, of please. Of course. Um, let's say you hire an accountant to do your taxes. And, and um, you know, when people take your course and really apply it, they're going to have a lot of taxes to pay because they're going to make a ton of money. But they want to have someone who's going to help them save as much on taxes as they possibly can, right? Mm -hmm. So they hire this accountant, and it's a really good accountant. And this accountant... Uh, charges, let's say, a $1,000. We're just going to use a round figure. $1,000. Uh, but what, that's his price, but what value is he giving in return that makes it so worth it to you? Well, uh, through his years of experience, through his constant uh, uh, studying, through his getting to know you and getting to know your business and how to best serve you, he's able to save you $5,000 in taxes, okay? He also saves you countless hours of, of, of work, mm -hmm. and he also provides you and your family with the uh, peace of mind and the security of knowing it was done correctly. Which probably, you know, so we see here that, that while, again, price is finite, value is both concrete in terms of that $5,000 savings, mm -hmm. but it's also conceptual, right, in terms of the peace of mind, the great feeling he gave you of, right? 
Um, and so what he did was he gave you well over $5,000 in value or use value in exchange for a thousand dollar payment or price or cash value. He gave you more in value than he took in payment. So you feel great about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but he also made a very, very healthy profit, mm -hmm. which he should. In fact, the, the, the basic function and result of a, free, a truly free market-based exchange is that both parties profit. Both parties come away better off after the transaction than they were before it. So that's the law of value in a nutshell. Bob, do you mind if I give a give an example in, in our business? In the multifamily space, an apartment can rent for $650 a month. Now that's the perceived value, perceived price. Now the perceived value is maybe we offer a dog park, maybe a fitness center, maybe our customer service is superior, maybe we treat people like they're supposed to be treated in the uh, C space because maybe they're neglected, but we give them that customer service. Maybe we have a police sheriff parking in the front for safety there. So that can translate into Mind. they know their kids are safe they're yeah. safe yeah. yeah so i just wanted to relay that that yeah, can go into good. into any situation you have in multifamily is because people like they say once it becomes a commodity you're trading just based on price you don't want that you want to see the inherent value in it anytime a consumer potential consumer cannot see a significant difference between two products two commodities it's always going to come down to who has the lowest price. Mm -hmm. And unless your last name is Walmart, and it isn't, you don't want to make low price your mm -hmm. unique selling proposition because mm -hmm. there's nothing unique about it. It ain't selling and it's not much of a proposition. Mm -hmm. When you sell on low price, you're a commodity. When you sell on high value, you're a resource. Mm -hmm. So your job is for that person to understand why that $650, why they're receiving much more in value than what they're paying in that $650, while of course you're making a, a very nice profit mm -hmm. from that $650. That's the, that's the law of value right there. Great, thanks. Uh, law number two, the law of compensation says your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. In the, um, uh, so where the law of, of, of value says give more in value than you take in payment, law number two tells us that the more people whose lives we're able to impact, to touch with that value, the more money we'll receive. Now, obviously with the accountant, if you're his customer, you feel great about him and you, you would do business with him again, you'd refer him to others and his other clients feel the same way. And uh, he's working with a whole bunch of investors who are referring him all over the place because he's specializing in your niche and knows how to help all of you save as much on taxes as possible. He's, he's earning himself an army of personal walking ambassadors as he continues to add that kind of exceptional value to more and more people. His income will continue to grow and grow. It's the same in your business with investing. That one person renting for $650, that's great. That's profitable. But what if you've got many, many, many people doing that and you've got many units and many complexes and many, well, now you're multiplying the number. So we could say exceptional value plus significant reach. Mm -hmm. equals very high compensation. I love that. That's great. Uh, law number three um, is the law of influence. And this says your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Now, this, again, sounds counterproductive, counterintuitive, but it's not. Uh, now, by the way, when we say place other people's interests first, we don't mean you should be anyone's doormat or self-sacrificial or, or a martyr, not at all. It simply means as Joe um, learned, and, and as, as Jake alluded to, the, it's about those relationships. It's understanding as Joe learned in the story from several of the mentors, again, all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. Well, here's the thing. There's no, there's no better, faster, more powerful way to elicit those feelings toward you in others and by genuinely and authentically moving from an I focus or me focus to an other focus. Looking to make, as Sam, one of the mentors in the story, advised Joe, making your win all about the other person's win. And I think that's what you were saying, Jake, right? That's, you know, that was that whole part about, about placing their- Sir, There's nothing wrong with service. People get like 
you know, maybe, it, I don't know. I, I just think, you know, giving awesome service to people and putting their needs, because that's in sales, you're, you're trying to find, you know, what's going to make their life better. That's the, that's your job and that's what you're getting compensated for. So that, that's why it's not, it's not self-sacrifice or something like that. You're not, exactly. that's, yeah, that's, absolutely. and, and I, I guess it's just such a, you know, because I've been there, it's like you know, the fact that you're even trying to explain it, I guess it's because there's folks out there that maybe that hasn't clicked yet. Oh, and that's oh, where, absolutely. yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's what it is guys. I mean, he's, he's, he's spot on with that. And so law number four is the law of authenticity. And this simply says the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. And in, in this chapter, one of the mentors, Deborah, shared a, a very important lesson that she learned. And that is all the skills in the world, the sales skills, technical skills, people skills, as important as they all are, and they indeed all are, they're all for naught if you don't come at it from your true authentic core. Now, on the other hand, when you, as we like to say, show up as yourself day after day, week after week, month after month, people feel good about you. They feel safe with you. They know you, they love you, they trust you. They're much more likely to want to be in a relationship with you. And they're much more likely to refer you to, to others, do business with you. One, I think, mistake people have about authenticity is they think that it means in a sense that you are who you are and you can't improve, you, you don't need to try to improve because otherwise that wouldn't be authentic. No, authenticity means you're always looking to grow into a more effective version of yourself. That's why it's so important to read and study and learn and continue to grow. Uh, we can learn from everyone. Uh, now, what we want to do, of course, is we want to adapt, not adopt. Adapt people's wisdom. Don't try to adopt their personalities. Mm -hmm. Be yourself. Adapt. Learn from all, but stay true to your authentic core. And then law number five, which kind of brings it home, is the law of receptivity. And this says the key to effective giving is to stay open to receive. And just as Joe, the protege in the story, learned from Pindar, the main mentor, uh, as human beings, we breathe out, but we also have to breathe in, right? We breathe out carbon dioxide. We also have to breathe in oxygen if we're going to survive, if we're going to thrive. We breathe out, which is giving. We breathe in, which is receiving. Mm -hmm. Despite the messages you get from the world around us, oh, and the messages are not mixed messages. They're really negative <laughs> messages about <laughs> money, about prosperity, about yes. what it takes to become wealthy. It's, and it's a shame, but it is what it is. And it gets into the head of people. It gets into the subconscious. And there can be, that's why people self-sabotage a lot when it comes to financial success. And what we've got to understand is that giving and receiving are not opposite concepts. They're simply two sides of the very same coin and they work in tandem. So it's not a matter of, are you a giver or a receiver? No, you're a giver and a receiver. What you realize though is universal law says the focus needs to be on the giving. The focus is on the giving, but then you need to allow the receiving. And when you do, when you're willing to do that, you will receive yeah. in abundance. Mm -hmm. You'll receive an abundance, an abundance of friendship, joy, love, money, new business, referrals, all the great things. You just need to make yourself open to that receiving. I love that. That's great. Um, before we get to the short answer questions, my last question was, what's your best tip for the listeners out there to find a mentor? And it's so important because having a mentor, just mm -hmm. cut your learning curve time, you know, I mean, that's what you do for people all the time. You cut their learning curve uh, mm -hmm. in terms of successful in their in investing career. Uh, I think one of the best ways to answer the question how to find a mentor is maybe to almost start with how not to find a mentor. Because I think what a lot of people do is they'll, they'll find someone who, and it could be someone locally, it could be someone they've kind of met online, or it could be some that what have you, but they'll kind of come right out and just say, hey, would you be my mentor? And I think when we do that, not that, that can't work sometimes, but not usually, and I think the reason why is because it's sort of like saying to somebody, hey, would you um, share your 30 or 40 years of wisdom, even though you don't know me from a hole in the wall? 
And a mentor protege relationship is just that it's a relationship and it develops over time. And so I think a better way to do it. Now that doesn't mean you can't ask anyone for advice. You certainly can, and you can begin the relationship that way. But to say to somebody, instead of, would you be my mentor, which is kind of, well, I don't really, you know, instead of that, I would just say to somebody, uh, you know, I'm beginning a career in so-and-so, or, uh, you know, I have a lot of admiration for your work. I understand you're very busy. So if this is not possible, I totally understand. Uh, may I ask you one or two very specific questions? And I think when you do that, you're letting this person know that you respect them, you respect their time, you respect mm -hmm. the process, you don't feel entitled to their wisdom, but you would appreciate it. And most people, not all, but most people will give you a time to ask one or two questions. They, they feel honored to be, to be asked something like that. And they don't feel defensive about being roped into a big thing right off the bat. You're just asking one or two questions. Mm -hmm. And of course, make sure you do your research. Don't ask them anything that you could have found out through looking on the internet. I mean, there's mm -hmm. no excuse for that these days. But, mm -hmm. uh, and then when they answer, look, answer the questions, let them know how much you appreciate it. Let them know you're gonna put that to use right away. You'll circle back around, let them know how things are going. What I would do is that very day, I would write a handwritten, personalized note of thanks, not a text, not an email, a handwritten note of thanks, very short, very brief, just a handwritten thanking them for their time. They're sharing their wisdom, letting them know that you'll, you'll look forward to putting that to use. I would also find out, uh, again, you can research this very easily, what's their favorite charity? Uh, are they an animal rights person or something? If so, make a, a, a small, it doesn't have to be anything big, make a small donation to the local um, humane society, the, the local one, not the national one, their local one, and, um, or their local shelter or what have you, and they'll be in their name, and they'll be notified. You're not doing it to kiss up or anything, but what you're doing is you're doing it to, to just show them again, you respect the process. Mm -hmm. You'll also let them know if there's anything you can do for them. If it's local, it might be running errands for them, or it might be making some calls for them, or anything that can in some way help provide value to you, you know, and so forth. And again, that's, oh, go ahead. No, I was, that's the key. It's, it's value for value. And I think when people, you know, I think the struggle with this mentor thing is that when people are looking for a mentor, they'll go and, the, the, and as you said, well, can I be your ment Can you be my mentor? Well, look, people are busy, right? And everything comes down to value for value as you're pointing out. And, you know, to, you know, if you make a donation, that's kind of helping bridge that for a couple questions and that's nice. But I think if you really need to say someone wants to mentor with you, I'm not, you know, I, I have no idea where you stand on this, but realistically, they should come and work for you for free for a couple months if you would be open to that because that they could actually learn over that period how the things work, how Bob does what he does, and then they could come and actually see it, you know, versus say like if you, you know, you went to college, you know, it's great. I didn't get any value out of college. Um, but I think if you actually went and trenched yourself instead of spending money on college to actually go work for an entrepreneur and work in the system, you know, and say, Hey, I'm, I'm willing to dedicate three months of my life because I know the value is going to be there. I think that's kind of the disconnect that people have these days, but they're not really, they're willing to ask, Hey, will you be my mentor and expect something in return? But they're not willing to pony up that time, that three to six months to say, I'm going to go and I'm going to learn because I know that's the guy that's doing it. I think that's where a lot of this stuff gets kind of, uh, where it breaks down at least. But. Well, certainly when it's, when it's appropriate and, and you're in the type of business and, and that person is or what have you, where you can actually, you know, help them in that way. I mean, yeah. that's really providing value back in which you're really getting. Yeah. And that's a great thing that it's not always something that can happen. And I think that a lot of times the value that a mentor receives by being a mentor, a lot of times is the good feeling that they have a student who really appreciates them and who, so sure, but, but absolutely, I agree with you to the degree you can do it. Because I mean, you can get value out of a couple questions, but I think it's more of seeing the habits, seeing, you know, how the person performs yeah. and, the, and the systems. But Again, uh, I think it's, yeah, I mean, I think yeah. it, it depends on what the, on what the kind of, in, in your business, absolutely, my goodness gracious, yeah. someone was going to, uh, you know, I, if I was going to invest and I, and I was able to get with a mentor like one of you guys, I'd say, I'm going to come out to where you are. I'm going to do all your legwork for you. I'm going to empty the trash for you. I'm going to go get your dry cleaning done. I just want to hang out with you and, and learn from you mm -hmm. and see what you're doing and, and so forth. They, you know, and that's, that's great. That's not always something that can happen in, the, in the, the world, but depending upon what you do. But sure, to the degree that you can, that you can really immerse yourself 
like yeah. that. Absolutely. Bob, we're running short on time. I want to ask you one question, and it's something to ask everybody. You've been wildly successful. What is your best habit for success, something you do every day or every week that, that's really propelled your career? I would say continuing to be a voracious reader and learner. You know, I, yeah. I never stop learning. Yeah. So I, I think that's, I mean, there's, you know, like anything else, we all have our different things and there's different daily habits and different things we do. But I, but I think mine is just continuing. Hey, it, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not small. You Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, right? So it's not like you're, you're, in, a, you're, you're, you're in a good crowd there. So. Um, before we hop off, how can listeners get a hold of you and what can you tell us about the new book? Oh, sure. Best way is just to go to thegogiver.com without the hyphen, just thegogiver.com. And um, if they'd like, it, it has a, a, a graphic of the new book and they can click on that. It will take them to that page and they can download the first two chapters uh, to see if they like it. If they'd like to pre-order it, uh, they can do so and they'll get a couple of really good um, bonus gifts. But uh, whatever they'd like to do is fine. But uh, yeah, just go to thegogiver.com. Everything's there. Okay. Um, awesome. Guys, if you found value in this show, please email Gino at jakeandgino.com, a screen grab of your iTunes review. And Gino will send you a free book of Wheelbarrow Profits and the review that he did of Bob's book. So, Bob, thank you so much for your time. This has been awesome. I uh, uh, really, really enjoyed it. Guys, Thanks, I Bob. appreciate it. This has been fantastic. Thank you both very much. You're welcome. Thank Have you. a great day, Bob. Thanks. We trust that you enjoy the Wheelbarrow Profits podcast. Visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. See you next time when Jake and Gino share more of their investing secrets with you.